gentlemen, do you not see that so long as society says a woman is incompetent to be a lawyer, minister, or doctor, but has ample ability to be a teacher, that every man of you who chooses this profession tacitly acknowledges that he has no more brains than a woman? So quoted Susan Brownell Anthony, an ab abolitionist, woman's rights activist, and active woman suffragist. She had quite the resume. She was co-founder of the New York Women's State Temperance Society in 1852. In 1856, she became the New York State agent for the American Anti-Slavery Society. Seven short years later, in 1863, she and her lifelong friend and co-worker in social reform, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, founded the Women's Loyal National League. This organization collected nearly 400,000 signatures to support the abolition of slavery. In 1869, there was a split in the women's suffrage movement. The debate fell apart over the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Susan and Elizabeth formed the National Women Suffrage Association. They felt betrayed that women were excluded from, those, from these two amendments. Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, and others favored the two amendments, that being the 14th and the 15th Amendment, fearing that they would not pass if women were included within these amendments. They formed the American Women's Suffrage Association also in 1869. Finally, in 1888, Susan B. Anthony helped to merge the two, these two large suffrage associations into one. They set their differences aside and thought that they needed to unite for the common cause of gaining women's suffrage here in the United States. The newly merged organization became known as the National American Women's Suffrage Association. This same year, Susan helped to co-found the International Council of Women. Susan B. Anthony was born on February 15, 1820 in Adams, Massachusetts, into a Quaker family. The family moved to Rochester, New York in 1827. Her father, Daniel, was a farmer and later a cotton mill owner and manager. Her mother, Lucy, came from a long line of patriots who served in the American Revolution and a Massachusetts state government. Susan had seven brothers and sisters, many of whom became activists for justice and fought to emancipate emancipate slaves. At the young age of 17, Susan began her activism for social reform by collecting anti-slavery petitions. In 1839, Susan accepted a teaching position in a Quaker seminary in New Rochelle, New York. From 1846 to 1849, Susan taught at a female academy in upstate New York. She enjoyed teaching, but found the compensation was insufficient. During this time, she reflected upon the legal injustice and the countless disabilities that women faced just because she was a woman. By 1850, she started speaking publicly in support of women's rights, for equal wages, for equal work. In 1868, Susan became publisher of a new periodical, The Revolution. Her co-supporter and friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, became the editor. In 1870, Susan relinquished her position with the periodical, and started traveling the nation, giving lectures to pay off the paper's accumulated debts. Within two years, the debt was paid for. In 1872, Susan was arrested for voting in her hometown, Rochester, New York. She was one of 15 ladies who voted. Seven other ladies in her hometown were registered, but not permitted to vote. Susan's trial was widely publicized. She was fined $100 for her crime, that crime being voting without having a lawful right to vote. She refused to pay that, pay the fine of $100 because she believed that she was in the right and she had every right to vote according to what the Constitution had said. In 1876, Susan led a protest at the 1876 United States Centennial and she gave a speech called Declaration of Rights. Two years later, Susan and Elizabeth presented to Congress with an amendment giving women the right to vote. It was introduced by Senator Aaron A. Sargent, Republican from California. This amendment later became known as the 19th Amendment and was ratified in 1920. Mission previously, Susan B. Anthony traveled throughout the country giving speeches. One of her stops was here in Worcester, Ohio. On Saturday, November 2, 1878, Susan gave a lecture at the Quimby Opera House. Women's, Woman wants bread, not the ballot. She was scheduled to give the same lecture in West Salem, Ohio on November 5, 1878 at the West Salem Schoolhouse. In her lecture, Susan's purpose was, quote, to demonstrate the great historical fact that this franchisement is not only political degradation, but also moral, social, educational, and industrial degradation, end of quote. 
although the lecture was well attended in many communities, it didn't seem to be quite so well attended here in, in Worcester. The Wayne County Democrat reported that Miss Susan B. Anthony had an average lecture audience at the Quimby Opera House on Saturday night. They continued to uh, review her lectures, indicating that from her standpoint, her lecture was, was a good one. She made her points well, and they really agreed that Miss Anthony was worth hearing. At the National American Convention held on February 8th to the 14th of 1900, a great tribute was given to honor Susan's 80th birthday. Mrs. Corley Franklin Cook so eloquently summarized the life of Susan B. Anthony as follows, quote, when Susan B. Anthony was born, a thinker was let loose. Her voice and her pen have lighted a torch whose sacred fire dies not, but whose penetrating ray shall brighten the path of woman down the long line of ages yet to come. Our children and our children's children will be taught to honor her memory, for they shall be told that she has been always in the vanguard of the immortal few who have stood for the great principles of human rights. End of quote. Corley was a women's rights activist, educator, public speaker, and a leader in the African-American community. Susan B. Anthony died on March 13, 1906, at the age of 86 years. Although she did not live to see the Susan B. Anthony Amendment become law, her legacy as an activist for human rights will be remembered for years to come. In 1979, to honor her work on behalf of women's rights, she became the first woman to be featured on a circulating coin from the U.S. Mint.